everyone. Today I am so excited to have with me author Mark Sullivan and here is his brand new book, Beneath a Scarlet Sky. Ah, Mark. <laughs> I love this book so much. So, so much. Thank you so much for talking to me. Yeah, I'm thrilled to talk to you. Yeah, well, okay, let me tell you a little story about how I found you. Found you, okay. quote unquote. So I am a huge James Patterson fan, okay? But for some reason, I found this book on Facebook. I'm, I'm in a whole bunch of author groups on Facebook, okay. right? So they were all like, read this book, read this book. And I, I started reading it and I didn't look you up, okay? And I started reading it and I'm like, wait a second. I go to the, I'm like, wait, this is the Mark Sullivan, like as in James Patterson Mark Sullivan. Even right. when I saw the front of the the book, it did not occur to me, but your writing occurred to me. That's where I figured it out, was because okay. of your writing. It's just yeah. crazy, you know? Like, the name, I was like, wait, this is the Mark Sullivan. This isn't just Mark Sullivan. So I was so excited when I, and then you said yes, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Cool. <laughs> so anyway, um... We have a lot in common. I, when I read the beginning of your, the preface of your book and you were talking about how you found this story and yes. you were talking about how um, you had lost your mom and your brother to um, alcoholism. Yeah. I lost yes. both my parents to alcoholism. So mm -hmm. right away, I felt like a connection in this, you know, of the finding, how you found this story and, and a little right. bit felt the grief that you felt about it. And um and I love the spiritual side of the story is that, you know, you, you were, you know, like kind of thinking about like, what am I going to do next? How am I going to do this? Do I even want to be here anymore? And then you ask and you prayed for an answer and you got it. And I was just wondering like, how, how was that? You know, when you found him, how, how was that? Did, did, did you know right away when you heard his name and you were like, oh my God, this is it. This is the... The story. It, was, it, it was the story. It was the fact that there was this Catholic boys' school in the Alps, and it was used as a staging center for Jews escaping Italy, and he was the original guide. And I heard that story, and I was floored. I was like, well, wait a second. This can't be true. We would have heard this story. And then I found out he was alive, and that changed the whole dynamic. And... Uh, yeah, from the second I heard the story, I knew it was the greatest story I'd ever heard. It was certainly the greatest untold story I'd ever heard. And I had to you know, dig and make sure that I was right, that there was enough there just even to go to Italy. And, and I, I believed that there was. And then I went to Italy and spent the first time three weeks with him and, and went to all the various locations with Pino and saw all these places and then I, did, I left Italy telling myself I was going to tell the story to as many people as possible. I just had no idea it was going to take me 11 years. Okay. I can't hear you. Okay. Is that coming from... Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, who would have thought, I mean... When I read this and, and read that it had taken you that long, I mean, the research that you had to do to put into this book, um, it's, it's just amazing to me and how many trips you made over there and, and, and meeting him and everything. I mean, people talk about it taking a year or two to write a book. I mean, this, this, was, a, <laughs> this was quite a book, you know? It's, it was an epic you know, journey just to get it. Um, I could feel right away that it was a passion project and that... I wasn't going to be able to accomplish this quickly. It was I was going to have to raise money and I was going to have to go back and back and back. And once I accepted that, I was perfectly fine with it. I just wrote other books, as you said, with, with James Patterson and on my own. And I kept it always simmering on the back burner. I would work on it whenever I had the chance. And then I would raise money and get time and go back to Europe. And the, between all of them, I was able to you know, come up with a story that I thought was as close to what happened as possible. You know, I really set out to write it as a nonfiction book right when I heard the story. And too many people had died, too many documents had been burned for me to get the kind of straight corroboration to write it. And I wasn't until, about, I guess it was about five or six years ago, I was in a discussion with a, an agent, uh, not my agent, just a woman that I, I knew. And 
she said, you know, ultimately this book came to a novelist, not a journalist. I know you were a journalist before, but it came to a novelist and I think you should write it as a novel. And it was a tremendous piece of advice because once I wrapped my head around the fact that I wasn't going to get every single fact corroborated, I was dealing in fiction and the whole parameter changed and my whole allegiance changed. My allegiance went from the facts to the emotions and my goal was to take the reader on the same emotional journey that I went on 11 years ago when I first heard the story. And certainly I wanted readers to identify and go on the same emotional journey that Pino went on. Exactly. And when you had had the, you know, the, the sort of revelation that you needed a project that was going to bring you out of um, a depression, were you, you were already a very accomplished author at that time. And so it's kind of shocking, you know, because we always think, you know, like, oh, well, you get to a certain level and then nothing can, you know, hurt you as an author, you know, right. but, but right. it did, you know, you did all of a sudden come to a point where a book went through that you didn't think was accepted the way it should be. And, and it kind of sent you to that place, you know, it did. It was like one of the final straws. I was in a big, long business dispute that had taken us to the point of personal bankruptcy and, I'd written a book that in the United States tanked and um, eventually it, it turned out that it did very well in Europe, um, mm -hmm. but that was after the fact. And, you know, I was the person who always believed that I had a lot of skills as a writer and as an artist and I was feeling like I wasn't getting anywhere. And that combined with the death of my, my younger brother and best friend and the business dispute just took me to a very dark place. And as you said, I begged for a story and three hours later I was given a story I mean I, I don't know how to describe it other than that um, you know I was a trained journalist I'm pretty not cynical but I'm skeptical about stuff and but there's no doubt in my mind that when I asked I was answered they just there's no other explanation that I was answered yeah I, I love that because I kind of came to that myself when I was going through my mom's death, which I thought she saw my dad die and learned something and then whatever, you know, she didn't. And, and it was really difficult cause she was young. And, um, after that I was like, what am I, I have six children. And, yes. You know, you think, you don't know when you're raising children, you just do it. You raise them, you raise them, you raise them. And then all of a sudden they grow up and I'm having grandchildren and, you know, and I was like, what do I want to do? What do I want to do that matters? that's going to right. make a difference. And right. I tried a couple of things and then I got to the point where it's like, well, what do I love to do? Well, I read all the time and I'd right. love to talk to, and so I just started, I was like, you know what? I think I want to talk to authors. And then it is, it's like this answer happens. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh, okay. So that is what I'm going to do. That's what I'm, I'm going to talk to authors. You know? Right. <laughs> so I really yeah. connected with that because it, it, I don't know. It was just a, 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 a prayer and then an answer kind of like, well, what do you love to do? And you got like, well, what do you love to do? You would like to take a story and write a weave a story. And I can, I took, um, James Patterson's masterclass. Okay. Huh? I did because I want, I read and I'm like, I want to hear what he says. Cause his books are amazing. I want to hear what he does and your book. That's why I recognized it right away. I was like, wait a second. This is reading like a, like a James Patterson book. <laughs> I mean, you know, I recognize it's a formula in a way that readers keep reading, you know, sure. reading so many books. You wove this story that you don't want to put it down. Like you get to a chapter and you're like one more and then one more. And then, you know, before you know it, you're like three quarters of the way done with the book and, and you haven't sure. done anything all day. So <laughs> well, good. I'm glad I did my job. You, you absolutely did your job because as a reader, like I said, I could go a whole day and be like, what time is it? Oh my God, I should get up. I should do things. You know? yeah. But that's your job is to get me to be that hooked in the book. And, sure. and you did that. And I am reading a lot of World War II books right now. I have to tell you, I just did two interviews in a row, historical fiction, World War II. It is a right. huge topic right now because in the world, we are coming to the end of where we can get um, real stories from. Okay, we're kind of in history. They're they're in their yes. 90s. I mean, that's yes. just the fact. That is that if you want to if you want to be able to interview someone, you got to start working on it now, right? Six thousand veterans die a day. 
in World War II. So every day, 6,000 stories are lost. So I agree with you 100%. It's, um, I apologize for that. Uh, wow, that is a huge, that's a huge statistic. And what I have found, um, even in my own personal life of knowing some um, World War II vets that have died, um, right. they, I did not hear, there's one, one particular man in, in, that I knew a long time, and until he turned 90, he never even told us his story. OK. Mm -hmm. And and that is like when I was reading what you wrote about him and then reading some of the the other press on you is that Pino wasn't out there to tell his story. These, these guys, you have to beg stories out of them. Even Especially Italians. Yes, absolutely. That's exactly right. They, they after what happened at the end of the war, you know, for most of the partisans, resistance fighters that I was able to interview, they rarely, if ever, talked about it. They wanted to move on. They were all young when it happened. You know, Pino was 18, Mimo was 16, um, and Eduardo Paniza, he was 16. There were a whole bunch of people that I spoke to that were very, very young. So after what they'd seen, they were just absolutely 100 committed to going on and bearing it and going on with their lives. Um, and so... You know, for Pino, that, that lasted for nearly six decades and uh, until he met Robert Dahlendorf and Bob just was roughly his age and they hit it off and Bob just asked him, what was the war like for you? And he started telling the story and Bob was floored, as floored as I was when I heard it, that you know, he was like, how, how is it possible we have never heard this story? And we never heard the story because the man who lived it buried it. You know, for nearly 60 years. And then luckily he began to open up to Bob. And when I got there, he really opened up to me. But it took a long time. It took a lot of trust building between the two of us. I'll tell you a story that, that I think is indicative of it. And it was, I'd been there almost three weeks. And Pino's uh, ex wife, who's also still his best friend, she invited us out to dinner, so we went to dinner, and ordinarily Pino's a very gregarious guy and very genteel and tremendous manners, and, you know, he's just one of those old-world European guys you just, you know, love the second you talk to him. And he was very quiet in, in the front seat, and Yvonne said, Pino, what's the matter? You're so quiet. And he looked at her and he said, Yvonne, you've known me more than 35 years. How many times have you seen me cry? And she said, Kai, I've never seen you cry. And he looked over his shoulder at me and he said, Mark, you've known me less than three weeks. How many times have you seen me cry? And I said, I don't know, nine or ten. And she almost crashed his car. And then she got mad because I had heard a story that she had never heard. And she had married to him for 15 years, 14, 15 years at the time, you know, before they got divorced. And then she'd been his best friend ever after. And that was very difficult for her uh, to realize that he had kept this buried for so long. And I mean, his own kids only knew pieces of the story. They knew about Father Ray. They knew about the general. Um, you know, that was pretty much it. He, he did, just didn't talk about it. And for me to get him to talk about it was especially, you know, the love story was uh, as brutal a thing as I've ever had to do as a reporter because I kept having to push him and push him and push him to gradually open up, which he did. I mean, thank God. And and then we got a real sense of the story at that point. Yeah, I am so um, – I love that these men are opening up about men and women are opening up about their stories because it would be such a tragedy to see them not, you know, that with things that we don't know because sure. these heroic, I mean, reading your book actually changed my life. Like, first of all, I have children. Not only have I been 16 and 17, but I have a son who's 18 right now. He's a senior. And I look at him, I, you know, while I'm reading this book, I'm reading and I'm looking at him and I'm like, okay, like, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, Pino was, you know, he was an average seventeen-year-old when the book starts, when the story starts. He's, you know, he's arguably a spoiled kid, and uh, right. and yet when he's put in a situation, the human spirit responds. And I, I tend to think that there are people like that in every horrific situation. That there will be people who will ordinary people who will go beyond themselves, who will in effect sacrifice themselves 
for something beyond themselves. And that's certainly what he did. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even what we're living right now, um, my, I have children in Texas right now, and they're just recovering from Harvey, and you hear all the stories coming out of that, and which is yes. in comparison, but it still is people, you know, so It's a disaster. It's people stepping up. It's right. people who didn't have to do anything, and they just... You know, and, and again, I know it's going on in places like Syria and any place that there's these kinds of crucibles, if you will, people will always rise up. And it's the most it's the most unexpected person usually who does it. Yeah. And it's and I had a son. I'm, I'm a military mom. I have two sons in the service. And um, my one son was in Iraq. He was in the army and he was the last unit in Iraq. And he became friends with the Iraqis. Sure. And it became difficult. And I was like, see, that's what war does. There's a human right. element. And there's things he won't tell me to this day. He's 28 right. and it's 10 years ago. And, you know, he won't tell me. But that's what war does to people. It, it, it crosses the line of enemies and friends. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing that it can happen like that. But that's what this book also showed me in it is that he – he started really caring about people that he wasn't going to get anything from them. Nothing, yeah. nothing from right. them, you know? And yet he was, he was, okay. You walked up. I, I, I read somewhere that you did the, the mountain that he was going up. Tell me about yeah. that. Tell me what, what was that so, was like. I didn't climb it we went in when it was still winter and, and I, but I skied into the route. Um, it's now a ski area, Valchia event. Wow. And, you can ski into all the, you know, the entire route to see it, understand how it works. So that's what I did. I've got video that we're, we've been working on this for months um, from my old films from that time where I, you can, I take you right to the top of the hard, the difficult route and you look down the spine and it's just breathtaking. I mean, really? to understand that people climb this in street shoes and no, you know, alpinist experience and they did it and they got up and over. And, and the fact that he got them up and over is just astounding to me. You know, Pino's one of these people who's always downplaying what he does. And I remember he was saying, oh, it's not that big a deal. Any competent alpinist can do this. And now I'm a competent alpinist. And I looked up at the route and I was stunned. I was like, that's no ordinary thing. That is a very, very difficult climb. And the fact that these people did it, you know, in the dark, they started, they always started, you know, early in the morning and they went uphill right. doing that. And, you know, the fact that they did it in snow and blizzards during avalanches, it was just astounding to me. It still is. It just completely blows my mind when I think about it. I, I bet that, well, I'm thinking that when, when I was reading it and I hadn't heard that you did it, it now makes sense to me is how you could get the greatest detail of yeah. him climbing, you know, because he was practicing that climb until he had to take people and he didn't know why he was practicing it, you That's know, right. for the father, for father, Rex. but, um, when he, the one story in there, and I'm not giving anything away, just so you know, I don't believe, I want everybody to experience this book like I got to, but the yeah. one story, um, that he had a pregnant woman. Okay. And yeah. that didn't he carry her through some of that? I mean, that to me, and, and I guess from how you described it, it wasn't just about the height, but there were some places that they had to go across. Was it like across? Spines. They had to cross spines, yeah. Okay. It's just so dangerous. I mean, if you, if you fall on the spine, you're going. And, uh, but spines are often where the wind blows off the snow, okay. right? So it was actually the safest way to go up, even though it was incredibly treacherous. If they had tried to go off down the flank of the mountain, mm -hmm. they would have been in snow up to their hips and they never would have made it. But if they can get up the spine and onto the top, then it's a downhill route into Switzerland. And that's why they took them up that way. It was remarkably because of the wind. And it was the wind scoured off these, you know, the very peak of the of the mountain, and they were able to walk right up of it. And you know, if you if you're if you're an alpinist, that's what you do, right? You look for where you can get your feet solid and on the spines is often where it occurs. Yeah, and the fact that okay, so he's doing you know, what I was thinking about when I'm reading this, um, he would take them up and over, okay? And yes. then he has to go back. 
And then he'd find out from father, like, oh, we're doing it again tomorrow or something. And he'd be like, like, this is not ordinary. Like, you know, to be like, okay, I'm going to go do that again. He's risking his own life. Again and again and again. And again and again. Yep. Yep. And they, you know, he would usually go back and he would spend the night in one of the huts that I described, and then he would overnight there, and then and he would go back to Medesimo and then up to Moda, and then he would rest, and then they would go again a day later. So it was a constant cycle, you know, as, as they could bring up people, um, refugees from Kempo del Chino through Medesimo and up to the boys' school, um, you know, they had to wait till the German patrols on the Splugen Pass were cleared. And then they would bring them up in ox carts and various other things to bring them up the mountain during the winter. And then they would climb. Yeah. Does he know how many people he saved? You know, he says personally somewhere between 30 and 60. I know from talking to Father Barbareski before he died that he knows of a minimum of 50 that went through Casalpina. And I asked him how he knew. And he said that it was because he did all the forgeries. But both of them agreed that, you know, Pino left in April 44 and the escapes went on all that summer and into the, into, you know, December of, or January of 45, they were still occurring. So my best estimate is somewhere between 150 and 200 went out through Casalpina. But in the whole north, you know, there, there was this thing called Operation Oscar that I really didn't get into, but that was... Basically, Father Barbareski, and when he was a seminarian, he was up at Casalpina, and Father Ray, after Barbareski took this big hiking group through um, the Angel Step and over into Switzerland the first time, 30 kids went out, and there were four, it was a family of Jews, so 30 went out, and 26 came back, and that's when they got the idea, okay, so then, but they knew they couldn't take these big hiking groups every time. So this became, what are we going to do? We're going to try to get the Jews out through these northern escape routes into Switzerland. And my research shows that at at least 600 went out through the north, through this Operation Oscar. And this was all run by Barbareski and various priests throughout northern Italy. It's it's an amazing story. It really is. And you were absolutely right. A lot of um, attention has not been paid to the Italian part of World War II. I know I haven't read much about it at all. So, you know, the fact that you brought this story and and talked about there, what they were going through. And, and this is, I I hear it's going to be a movie. It is going to be a movie. It's very exciting. Um, Amy Pascal, who's the most powerful woman in Hollywood. uh, She has a um, wonderful people who work for her, including a woman named Avery Huffine. And, I'll give you an idea of the serendipity of this story, which it, there's been so many instances of incredible things happening. But so Pino's son, Michael, gives an advanced copy of the book to this woman named Happy Hudek in Mammoth Lakes, California. And she's in her late 80s and she used to be a ski instructor at Mammoth with Pino and they you know, remained friends. So he gave, sent her a copy of the book. She read it, loved it. And she had some friends who lived in Mammoth Lakes and she knew vaguely that their daughter worked in Hollywood, had no idea what she did. And she gave it to her friends and said, you need to read this and give it to Avery. And they're like, oh, we don't do that kind of thing, but we'll read it. So they read it and they were blown away and they called up their daughter and said, you really need to read this. And her daughter's rolling her eyes and uh, she goes, okay. And so they sent it down and a week goes by and her mother's calling her constantly and so Avery finally says, okay, I'll read it just to make sure that I know that it's not worthy. And she read it. And two days later, she picked her head up and she said, oh, my God. And she went into Rachel O'Connor, her immediate boss, who's Amy's partner. She read it. They got Amy to read it. And she said, we're making this movie. And so we went into negotiations with her, which was awesome, and got almost to the point where we had it. And then they showed it to Tom Holland, who played in Spider-Man Homecoming and Tom is perfect for the role, and he fell in love with it. That is so amazing. And I didn't when I was reading it, I didn't know that. And as so, I'm sure, I'm thinking movie, movie, you know. Right. And I was right. like, I just hope, I just hope they have a movie. And you know, what's really funny is um, uh, James Patterson in that 
class I took, that master class, he talks about one of his books that became a movie. And he showed up on the set and they changed everybody's name and they changed they added people and, and he yeah. was like, who are these people? And, you know, like, right. so it was kind of funny that, you know, cause he talked about like his experience, but I don't think they can do that with this book. So I think you're saying, yeah, especially since I'm executive producing it with Amy oh, and Rachel, there you go. Um, I'll make sure that doesn't happen. That's, that's my job is to keep it as close to the story as possible. Well, do you know when it's going to start? I would think a minimum of 18 months. This is a big movie, you know. It's it's a sprawling epic. It's like Dr. Shivago. So there's a lot of things that have to fall into place before we can start shooting. That said, they want to make this movie in the next three years. Awesome. And that, I mean, and I, that I, in Hollywood time is like fast. It's fast. <laughs> it's fast. That's fast. Right? So yes. in the meantime, what are you working on? Uh, well, I'm working on some stuff with Mr. Patterson, and I'm also I'm playing with two different ideas for a book, one of which is called The Abbot of Venice, and it's about a guy who, a Benedictine monk who became an abbot in the 17th century at the end of the plague years in Venice, and he becomes one of the most powerful. He goes from a street urchin to become one of the most powerful people in Venice at the height of Venice's power. And I don't know why I'm fascinated by it, but I am. And, and, you know, it's such a different thing than what you do with James Patterson. I mean, those are all thriller, you know, but but after doing this, I'd imagine, like, you love the story of the real people and, and to bring yeah. historical fiction to life. I, I'd imagine that's such a different, you know, different thing for you. Yeah, it is. It's a very different thing. I really enjoyed it, and evidently I'm pretty good at it. And I'm so... <laughs> So I'm going to write another one, more historical fiction. I really enjoy doing it. And uh, I haven't quite figured out if it's The Abbot of Venice or the story of my mother's next-door neighbors who escaped Germany just in advance of the Holocaust. Um, I haven't decided which one I'm writing first. Oh, that's awesome. And I have to tell you, I am so happy I didn't know who you were when I asked you. Because I yes. don't think I would have. I would have been way too intimidated. And and so I'm really happy that, you know, to me, you were just the guy that wrote this book when I asked you to come on here. And then, you know, I come to find out who you really are. And I was just like, oh, my God, I get to actually talk to him. So I'm so thrilled that you talked to me today. You, you've, oh, made my, you've made my day. That's for sure. And oh, everybody, yeah. here is the book. Please read it before the movie. I always read books before the movie. It, it just lends something to it. And you will not be sorry. I will have all of your links at the bottom here. And, um, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a great day. You too. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.